All right, welcome everyone to this technical workshop on using the Python API for transportation network analysis. I am Dilesh Mandlo and helping me today is my colleague Dimitri Kudina. We both work with the network analyst team out of our Redlands office. So before we start, if you want to take a picture, please take a picture of this slide because it has the URL where you will find this slide as well as all the notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks and code samples that we'll be showing during this presentation. And uh, if you want to take, say if you want to leave for some reason, you still have this slides and all the slides. And the, impo the most important message that you should get from this workshop is whenever you are starting, read the REST API doc first and then read the doc for your SDK because the REST API doc is where you'll find all the concepts and the SDK doc is where you will find how to apply those concepts using your programming language of choice. In this case, we are talking about Python, but this applies to any other SDK in case you are using that. So I'll pause for a few more seconds and then move along. Okay, so you have all this, this, this URL is live, uh, you can get to these slides. So what are we going to cover today? So today we are going to, in the first part of our presentation, we are going to cover what different types of analysis you can do on transportation networks. Uh, and then we will see what are all the different services that are available to you so that you can execute those analysis. And then once we have looked at what all analysis we can actually perform, we can then see how you can go ahead and do those analysis using the Python API. So what are the different uh, analysis that are available to you? So uh, ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise. Now this talk, the session title said ArcGIS Online, but what I'm, what I'm, whatever I am talking is equally applicable to ArcGIS Enterprise. We are going to use the services available in ArcGIS Online, but the same services can also be made available in your ArcGIS Enterprise. So everything I'm talking about is exactly applicable there. I will be just using ArcGIS Online for now, but just keep in mind that everything is also available in ArcGIS Enterprise. So as part of directions and routing services, which allow you to solve, trans, uh, solve analysis on transportation networks, we have these seven core capabilities that are available to you. Starting from uh, capabilities that do point-to-point -point routing to advanced routing with multiple vehicles, or capabilities that allow you to access coverage like service area or display real-time traffic information, or generating a travel cost matrix or finding uh, suitable locations. I'm going to describe this in a bit more details in subsequent slides. Now, before I get there, common to all these analysis or common to all these services is a global network, uh, global street data that ESRI manages when you are in ArcGIS Online. So this street data has real time and predictive traffic information as well as historical traffic information has support for various travel modes such as driving, walking, and trucking, supports advanced logistics attributes like weight and height restrictions, and uh, other attributes like using preferred truck routes or avoiding toll roads. This data is maintained by ESRI. It's updated four times a year, so you can expect it to be current. And in this slide, I'm providing a link to a coverage map from where you can figure out what kind of coverage you can expect in your area of interest. So as I mentioned, I wanted to show you all the different capabilities, which is what I'm going to show you uh, in my demonstration here. So what I'm going is I'm going to the uh, developers.arcgis.com, which is the site you should be going for doing anything related to ArcGIS if you are a developer. There we have a feature space for routing and directions. If you haven't looked at this page in recent, uh, in recent past, you should, because this is something that we have revamped. It describes an overall idea of all the routing capabilities that are available in ArcGIS. And I'm going to use this page to uh, show you the different services that are available in ArcGIS Online. So the first one is the route and direction service. So this is a service where given the first stop, which is the green marker, and the end destination, which is the red marker, and the stops in between to visit, how, what is the best route to find? So the service gives you the total distance and total travel time along with driving directions if you want to request it. It can also avoid traffic incidents, like say for example, there's an accident on uh, 101 freeway, so it will find out the route which can avoid that accident. The, uh, an, another option with this service is to actually find an optimized route. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say your first and the, uh, your start and the end locations are fixed, 
but in between you have to visit the stops in an optimized sequence so that your total time and distance is minimized. So if you compare the two routes here, the distance savings are 30% and the time saving is 25%. Why? Because the service actually figured out what is the best inter what is the best sequence for the intermediate stops so that you are minimizing the overall time and distance. So this is what we call as optimized route. Now these services can use real time traffic information and you can as well in your apps display this traffic information as a dynamic map service. So in this case here it's showing real time traffic as it is uh, in New York City and it's also showing incidents here with a, a dot here. So this traffic service is updated every five minutes so you always get the live traffic information and it's up to date and all the routing services use this traffic information when they are doing the analysis. So the route service that I showed just before can also make use of the time so the routes that you are uh, sorry of traffic so the routes that you are finding actually can use that traffic information. Uh, next capability we have is to find the drive time area so uh, given a point or a set of points and a, and a time or a distance value the service can find out what all areas you can cover in that time or distance. So let's say let me move back to New York City and here from this location within 25 minutes of drive area I can cover so much of uh, area. So this can be useful to let's say figure out how many customers live within 25 minutes of my store. Again this service can also use traffic so if you are doing this analysis with traffic into account you can see the area grow and shrink based on the traffic conditions that are relevant for that time of the day. Next one is the route to closest facility. Now this is the routing service with a slightly different twist. So in this case uh, you are at the green marker. This could be your current GPS location or a location of your asset in the field. And the blue markers are all the other assets or other facilities uh, that are also out in the field. And you want to figure out from my current location or my, uh, or my incident what is the closest facility based on the travel time and travel distance and what is the best route to it. So it's finding things in proximity using the travel time and travel distance and also finding routes and driving directions to it and it can accommodate traffic as well as you can specify find me three closest facilities within 10 minutes. So this can be useful for scenarios where you say you want to dispatch a police car uh, to the closest, uh, closest police car to the accident location. Now moving to uh, more advanced uh, capabilities. The first one is to the ability to route multiple vehicles. So let's say in this graphic you have two trucks, the orange truck and the green truck and you have seven orders that you want to visit. You want to say make some furniture deliveries. So how would you divide up the work between those two trucks? Now along with dividing the work efficiently so that you are minimizing the overall time and distance, you may also have other constraints like the deliveries may have some time windows. Let's say this customer requested delivery between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. the other one requested delivery between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. So you want to take into account those time windows. There might be another constraints like your drivers may need to have one designated break between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. Also there might be other regulations like your uh, route shouldn't be more than eight hour long because your drivers work only in eight hour shifts. So you can give all these constraints to this multi vehicle route service and then it will give you uh, all the different routes and which orders should be serviced by which routes uh, that will minimize the overall cost. The next service we have is what we call as location allocation. This service allows you to site new facilities. So let's say in this graphic here I have four candidate or prospective sites where I can open a new store and the blue dots here are all my customers where my customers are. Now which one out of these four would you pick? or should you pick so that everyone drives the least amount of time to your store. So this is the kind of problem that this service can solve. So given this input to the service, you can say find me one be first best or second or two best uh, locations that will service all my demand within the minimum travel time. So that's the kind of problems the service can solve. Now your stores can have capacity, so this service can also uh, take into account capacity constraints. Let's say you are assigning students to test centers and each test center can only accom accommodate X number of students so you can have those capacity constraints and then the service will assign the closer students to the closest test center but once that test center is full it will go to the next closest and then start assigning students there. Uh, the overall objective would be still to minimize your time and distance. The last service that we have is 
what we call as the uh, generate travel cost matrix. So this service allows you to measure time and distance from a given set of origins to all the destinations. So in this case, I have seven, uh, seven points or seven uh, stops and I want to find a time and distance from one stop to all the other stops. So it's kind of a matrix that you want to calculate of time and distances. So this service can do that. It's only calculating the matrix. It's not giving the actual routes or driving directions. So that way it can actually scale to a, lar uh, a lot of uh, large problems. You can probably want to say, find me distance from each patient to three closest healthcare providers. So this would do that so that you can access or you can evaluate the coverage. So those are all the different capabilities that are available as part of directions and routing in ArcGIS Online or in ArcGIS Enterprise. Okay, so before we move on, once you start doing analysis using these capabilities, the first thing you should always spend some time uh, discussing and evaluating is how to pick the correct analysis type. Like I showed you, there are seven different analysis types. When you're trying to tackle a problem, you should make sure you have evaluated all the different analysis types and then come up with the right solution. So let's say here I'm giving you an example case study. A healthcare provider wants to find uh, uh, driving time and driving distance to five closest uh, healthcare facilities from every single patient location in the country. So they're, 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 those could be millions of patient locations. From each patient location, uh, the study wants to find out the time and distance to five closest healthcare facilities. The only requirement here is to find time and distance. Now, as you start uh, doing this problem, you might think, oh, I'm, I can probably do service areas, which will be areas uh, around my healthcare facilities, and then figure out how many points are within each of the area. So in this case, I have three healthcare facilities. I have calculated five, 10, and 15 minute service areas or drive time polygons around those three healthcare facilities. I have my patient locations. I might do a point in polygon overlay to figure out which patients are within the five minute polygons, which patients are within the 10 minutes, which patients are within the 15 minutes. Well, while this approach kind of works, but it's not accurate. Why? Because you may know that a patient falls in the five minute polygon, but you don't know the exact distance or exact travel time. The patient could be two minutes away, the patient could be four minutes away, the patient could be five minutes away, but you don't know the exact value. And our goal was to actually find the exact value. So this is actually not giving us the most accurate results that we want. Also the service area polygons, because they represent the polygons using vertices, they can grow. Let's say if you have one, uh, 10,000 healthcare providers drawing 10,000 service areas around all those polygons uh, or along all those healthcare providers, might be too much to keep into memory or even post-process using other services where you might do the point in polygon analysis. So for this particular kind of analysis, this is not the right network analysis capability that you would actually use. Let's say approach two, you might do a closest facility analysis where you might load your healthcare facilities as your facility, your patient locations as incident, and then from each patient location, you're finding five closest healthcare facilities. This will work. It will give you the exact time and distance value, but this is slightly inefficient for this particular requirement that we have, where we are only interested in the time and the distance value. We are not interested in the actual shape or the driving directions on how patients would get to the healthcare facilities. So while this service will give you the accurate results, it's not the most efficient. So we don't want to use this for our uh, workflow. Third time is the charm, right? Although we are also running out of options. So third, you might want to approach this using the OD cost matrix service or the origin destination cost matrix. Now the OD cost matrix actually does the same analysis as closest facility in terms of find me five closest from each of my patient locations, but it does not calculate the actual routes as well as the driving directions. It's still measuring uh, time and distance on the network, so you're still doing the accurate analysis, but it's not doing the additional overhead computations that you don't need for this particular scenario. And this would scale really well for the large problem size that we have. Every single patient location, find five healthcare facilities, this is the service that you might want to use. So we have seen the different analysis 
and how we can pick the right analysis. So from the previous example, you know to do that analysis, you want to use the OD cost metric service. Now, how do you actually go ahead and ac execute those, uh, execute that analysis? You do that in ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise using services. Services are what allow you to perform network analysis. There's nothing happening locally really on your machine. You are just saying, take my inputs, give that to the service. The service will actually do the computation and give you back the results. So services are the key drivers here on, on that are doing work. Now, what are the different services that are available for you to perform analysis on transportation networks? Now, Python API also does all of its analysis using these services. So there's nothing magical in Python API that's happening locally on your machine, especially in terms of doing routing or network analysis. Python API is going to call all of these services to actually do the work. Now, the services that are available can be classified into two bins or two of these categories. One is the routing and the direction services. The other one is the spatial analysis service tasks. So all the capabilities are available, but you might think, okay, why do we have these two classification? That's because there's a reason. The routing and direction services actually expose all the capabilities that are available with one with particular analysis type. Whereas the spatial analysis service tasks only expose certain key workflows and they re return the outputs as a hosted feature layer. So the outputs are automatically stored in your portal, whether ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise, and they are meant to solve very focused workflows. Whereas the routing and direction services are fine grained and they expose all the different capabilities. So again, when you are doing your workflows, Make sure you have evaluated all the services. First of all, you should be aware that there are these all these services available and not just get to the first service and just start using it and don't know if there are other options or not. No, make sure you evaluate all the different options and then pick the correct one. So what can help you in that evaluation process? Some things to note is each of these service have an execution mode. So a service can be synchronous or it can be asynchronous. What do I mean by a synchronous execution mode? In a synchronous execution mode, a client, let's say the Python API, would submit the request to the service, wait for the service to execute that response, that call is a blocking call, and then once the service processes the response, the client side code will start executing again. So that's the synchronous execution. Now you usually do this, because it's a blocking call, you usually do this if the request executes very quickly. So say you want to do point-to-point -point route, that should probably take half a second, you use the synchronous execution. But when you're processing large inputs, or you're doing something in batch, you may want to do asynchronous execution mode. What is asynchronous execution? In this case, you're submitting a job to a service, the service queues up that job, whenever the service has resources, it will start executing your job, your client-side code is free to do whatever you want to do while that job is executing on the server, your client side code will periodically check if the job has been executed successfully. Once the job has been executed successfully, the client side can download the results and then can start processing. So this is how you can really solve something that can take an hour because you don't want your code to be blocking for an hour. You just want to submit something and poll for it after, the, after some duration and just check if that job has been completed or not. Other things you may want to note is service limits. Now each of these services, especially when you're using them in ArcGIS Online, have limits enforced on them on the size of the inputs that you can process. That's because we don't want single person to bring down the whole system by submitting a very, very large problem. So when you are using ArcGIS Online, you should always check what limits are enforced on a particular service. How can you find out the limits? There is an animated GIF going on here which shows how to get to these limits from the REST API documentation check the REST API documentation for the service, the limits are explicitly listed out there. If you are writing an app and you need to query these limits programmatically, because you may want to say, give a better client side experience where you can say, no, this, is, this input is too big for the service that I'm using, so I don't want to handle this input. You can also uh, determine these limits programmatically using helper services that we have available. Now, if your input exceeds these limits, what are your options? First option would be to do it to do this analysis in ArcGIS Enterprise where you host the services so there would be no limits. If you still have to use ArcGIS Online, 
you can actually break up your problem into multiple smaller chunks and then process those chunks one by one and then later combine out the results. So it's a classic example of map reduce or divide and conquer where you're saying, oh, I'm dividing my problem and that's how I'm conquering my big problem that I want to solve. If you're interested in knowing how to do or how to go about chunking your problem and solving them using a service, uh, I would be giving a demo theater uh, this evening at 3.30 or at 3 o'clock in the Esri Showcase Island, which will actually explain how you can solve a large OD problem using Python uh, by solving it into smaller chunks. Now we saw services have execution mode, services have limits. The services also require service credits. Again, this is only applicable if you're using in ArcGIS Online, but you have to be, uh, you, you need to be aware of that the services are not free. You have to pay service credits to actually execute them. Uh, you pay credits for every successful execution based on the size of inputs that you have. So the credits will be based on the number of routes you're generating or the number of polygons you're generating. So you have to be always aware of the credits that you might need to run these services. You can track the credits that you're using from the ArcGIS online organization dashboard or from the developers dashboard. And uh, I have provided a link here which explains and lists all the credits that are required by the various routing services the traffic service and the utility service that can allow you to get travel modes or get the uh, limits on the service itself. They don't require credits, but every other service as uh, available as part of the routing services do require credits. And finally, let's say you have your ArcGIS online subscription, you have the credits. You also need certain privileges associated with your named user identity to be able to access these services. Now, routing and direction services, remember we had two bins routing and direction services, spatial analysis tasks, they require different sets of privileges. Routing services will just require the, your named user to have a network analyst privilege. The spatial analysis service along with the network analysis privilege would require you to have a spatial analysis privilege as well as content creation and hosted feature service creation privileges because those services are actually creating content in your portal. Again, I've provided a link which describes all these privileges in details and which you would need for which type of services. So now we have looked at all object or all decision making tools that we have. So now how do you choose the correct service type for your analysis? Always keep in mind that a particular analysis can have multiple services. Let's say route analysis can actually be executed using three different services a synchronous route service, the asynchronous route service, these two are part of the routing and the direction services, and then the connect origins to destinations task within the spatial analysis service. So all these three do routing. So which one do you pick? Now that depends on your workflow, the execution modes that you want, the service limits that are enforced, and whether you want the results as, an, uh, as a hosted feature layer or you, result, you want your results as a JSON so that you can post process them. So, be, uh, always be aware of these options so you choose wisely what you're trying to evaluate. Now we have seen at the different analysis we have, uh, we have seen what are the different uh, services and we have also seen how we can pick those services. Now how do you go about executing these services in your code? In this talk we are going to talk about the Python API, but whatever I have talked so far is applicable whichever SDK you're using. We are going to see how to use these services in the Python SDK or Python API. So in the ArcGIS API for Python, now this is not an introductory talk about it. So I'm not going to go into how you install it. You can find it in the documentation, which is pretty good on how you install it and how you get started with the ArcGIS API for Python. But when you want to access the routing and direction services, you access them from the ArcGIS.network module. If you're looking for the spatial analysis tasks, then you access them from arcgis.features.analysis module. Now, if you, are, if you haven't used Python API a lot, it's using Python, but what it also relies heavily is on the Pandas data frame. Pandas is a data analysis library for Python, which is heavily used by the Python API. So if you haven't used Pandas, and in particular data frames in pandas, I would highly recommend you first get comfortable using pandas and the data frames and then start using the uh, Python API because it will help you uh, to achieve a lot more with the API and you'll find things a lot more easier. Now, I'm not going to cover data frames in detail, but 
A data frame is essentially a data structure that represents a table. So it's an efficient data structure for representing tables. And as you can see in, in GIS, we use a lot of things are represented as tables. Your feature class is a table, your features are a table with a shape column with a bunch of attributes in it. So data frames are a representation of tables. So it's really helpful to know about data frames so you can easily manipulate tables and so on. Once you're comfortable with pandas, if you're starting with the network analysis part, refer to the guide and then to the sample notebooks. I've provided this explicit links on where you can find these guides in sample notebooks. So now I'm going to show you a quick demonstration on how you can get started with the Python API without actually installing anything on your machine. Just from a browser, go to a website, which is notebooks.esri.com. That's where we are hosting a Jupyter notebook environment. By the way, how many of you have never heard about Jupyter in this room? Okay, it's very few. So for you, Jupyter is just a, a notebook based experience. So think of it as running Python code. You usually, if you're interacting with Python and you're just trying out few things, you open up a command prompt, type your Python, open the Python interactive shell and start typing commands. Or that's what we call as a REPL, read, evaluate, print loop. Now, uh, Jupyter notebooks actually allow you to do the same kind of interactivity, but in a browser based environment. So you open up a browser, you get a notebook there and in your notebook, you start typing Python code and you start executing it. So it just lends itself well to showing things quickly and easily instead of showing a command line interface, we are showing a rich browser based interface. So that's what the notebooks are in a nutshell. And I'm going to show you how you can get started using the uh, Python API playground that is available to you. Now again, you don't need anything for accessing this environment. So I went to notebooks.esri.com. The first time you go there, it will create a unique user for you. And now you have the full Jupyter environment available to you. So let's say you just, you're just getting started. You create a new notebook. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, so here you are. Now think of it as just your interactive Python shell where you can start typing commands. So if I want to get started with the API, I can start running code. I'm here just going to print the version number of the, and it's printing me the output. So you can get started with it. It also provides you the code completion that you might expect. So I was saying all the routing stuff is in arcgis.network. So you can select that. And then within that, you have all the different tools that we have available, closest facility and all the different analysis. If you are doing the spatial analysis task, you might want to go to features dot analysis. Then within analysis, you will find all the different tools like connect origins to destinations, as I was talking about. So that's how you get started. Now I was talking about the guides and the sample notebooks that are available within the Jupyter environment. And you can actually get to those uh, uh, guides here in the guide folder. So when you go to notebooks.esri.com, all of the SDK samples are already available here for you to try out. So let's say here we have one for performing network analysis. Uh, you can open performing route analysis, and now you can start and start executing these. You can bring in your credentials or you can use the credentials embedded in it. So it provides you nice uh, text along with the code and you can execute and play around with the code. So it just allows you to work with the API in a slightly easier way. Now, mind you, this is not taking away any of the Python that you might have already known where you are writing command line tools or you're using Python in scripts and so on. That's all still there. Jupyter just gives you another way to write your code and to execute your code. You can still use the Python API in your Python code alongside ArcPy. If you have used ArcPy with ArcGIS software before, ArcPy and ArcGIS are two separate Python packages that complement each other. They are not competing with each other. They are complementing each other. Think ArcPy as all the local analysis that you can do using ArcObjects or ArcGIS desktop software. Think ArcGIS package is something you want to use for doing the web stuff. Anything with WebGIS, anything with ArcGIS Enterprise, anything with ArcGIS Online, you want to use the ArcGIS package. Anything with your ArcGIS Pro or your desktop or local ArcObjects, you want to use ArcPy.
So some of the takeaways, uh, notebooks.esri.com is your Python API playground. You can just be on a tablet on your iPad and you can start, uh, you have to type, so I don't know how easily you can type from an iPad, but if you are, if you don't want to install any software, you can sign up for a trial account for ArcGIS Online. It gives you 200 service credits. You can try these services out using notebooks.esri.com, no other software required. You can run existing notebooks or you can upload your notebooks and run it on that server. You can create notebooks there. That environment is temporary, so there's no storage available there. Once you have edited or created your notebook there, you can download it and then save it locally on your machine or put it in Google Drive or wherever you want to store it. And I would say if you are just getting started, go to notebooks.esri.com, fire up a new notebook and just start exploring. So now my colleague Dimitri is going to show you a sample notebook that we developed for this presentation, which is using all the services that we talked about, routing as well as some other services to actually perform a case study that my friend Dimitri is going to explain to you. So Dimitri, I'm going to switch over to... Well, thank you very much, Dilesh. And uh, suddenly, at the very minute when <laughs> actually Dilesh handed the uh, control to me, uh, something happened to my notebook. But let me restart the process. And I'm, actually, this is good because I'm going to show you how you can upload your existing uh, Python notebook with uh, uh, files to that uh, notebooksexec.com and run it from there. So once I get there in that uh, folder, I can specify upload and, sp and upload whatever files I want, including, in this case, a CSV file and my uh, ready-to-use uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, so now I got uh, the data files, the data file, which is uh, actually a CSV file and the uh, notebook. And yeah, you see it, it's running here. So. Uh, uh, detail, uh, Delesh provided you with uh, a very nice details and layout of the services and the API of, uh, of uh, network analysis services inside how they look from within uh, Python API. So now let's take a step back and see what really we can do uh, with that. So we crafted this uh, notebook specifically for this demo, but this uh, is uh, a real case, a real life scenario. Uh, let's imagine that I'm a, um, I'm an owner of a network of childcare facilities in uh, San Francisco, and I have a budget for, uh, let's say, about three, uh, three small size facilities. But where can I, where should I place them? I contacted a real estate agent, uh, and uh, she provided me with uh, five plausible addresses of about the same budget. Uh, slightly different capacity, how many kids they can uh, accommodate, but the budget is pretty much the same. And out of these five locations, I would like to choose three. This is my, this is my budget. Uh, so what can I do? Uh, and actually with uh, Python API and just ArcGIS Online account with access to network analysis and geo enrichment service, I can actually solve this problem right here. This is a very simple uh, notebook, but uh, yet quite, quite powerful. And this is what I'm going to show you right now. So let me start with the standard uh, things. I'm importing ArcGIS package with uh, pandas here, and then I'm signing in into, uh, into portal ArcGIS Online. Okay, let me, let me start it from scratch. Hmm. Well, let me try it one more time. Ah, sorry. Good, you didn't see Dimitri typing his password. <laughs> and, okay, good. So, um, I signed in into the, into the portal, uh, and now I'm going to uh, specify just a couple variables, uh, saying which particular study area I'm going to be looking at, uh, which will be used in geocoding, 
the base map and the zoom level, zoom level, just uh, utility variables. Now, uh, before I get into the detailed analysis, uh, analysis, I'm going to check using a service area service uh, and just dropping the point inside the service, uh, the San Francisco uh, metropolitan area and build uh, drive time disks of 10 or 5, 10, and 15 minutes trail time from the San Francisco point. Uh, and see if actually there are even a growing demand in the uh, kids' population, which I'm interested in. Uh, so here I'm going to uh, define my service area rings uh, as a study area for the GE enrichment. Then I'm going to specify for the GE enrichment uh, service that this service area rings need, this is what needs to be taken as uh, the geometry to be enriched with. And then I'm specifying which particular variables uh, I'm interested in. So in this case, it's uh, pop0 underscore cy and pop0 underscore fy. These two variables, you can find the list of this and, uh, and the many, many other variables uh, on the joint enrichment uh, website. There are thousands of them, and we have a global coverage, very detailed. But um, just for about these two, this is actually uh, the uh, population uh, of kids of age of zero to four, including years old. Uh, for the CY, it's 2017, and for the FY, it's prognosis for 2022, so five years ahead. So I'm querying these two variables for these two, uh, uh, for these three uh, uh, polygons produced by service area for the San Francisco, and I'm going to calculate the change, essentially, how this population is going to change. Okay. Just one more. Okay. Can you see it better now? Okay. So I'm running this uh, uh, request, and let's see how it looks on the map actually now. All right. So these are three polygons, service area polygons, which I uh, told you as my study area. I just uh, threw them into that uh, jack-coded service uh, San Francisco uh, point, uh, point, and uh, five, 10, and 15 minutes polygons are here. And uh, if I click on it, I get actually uh, the information about these two variables associated with it. So this is how many uh, kids in 2017 and 2000. 22 is and uh, are going to be there within this polygon. Quite powerful, even at this point. Uh, it's, also, uh, it's also interesting that actually I can see a positive number here, the change. So uh, about 1,800 kids more will be there in, in the next five years. Cool? So. But it still doesn't answer the question, where, what are the three best out of these five locations proposed by the real estate agent are? So this is where we are getting into, um, into a more interesting and challenging task of, uh, of getting more detailed information about uh, this growing population. And uh, what I'm going to do next is essentially uh, specify an area uh, for uh, more fine-grained querying of uh, joint enrichment endpoint to create my demand points. Demand points, this is something which is used for the location allocation service, uh, which also has a global coverage, to uh, associate and to assign them to the facilities in the most uh, productive or uh, optimal way, depending on the location allocation sub-problem which we are solving. So, how to create these demand points? Well, it's a fairly straightforward process. What I'm going to do is essentially create a grid uh, of th arbitrary numbers, uh, arbit arbitrary number of cells. In this case, I'm going to be doing 30 by 30 uh, cells, square cell cells covering this uh, San Francisco downtown area. And then every single cell I will be sending to a geo enrichment endpoint to uh, populate these two exact variables which you have seen uh, before with the service area request. So this is what I'm doing here. So I got, uh, I got the extent and I covered that San Francisco with that grid of 30 by 30 square cells. Cool? 
uh, very very simple, nothing nothing special. Uh, then I'm going to actually send in a single line of uh, of a statement. Uh, all the cells to the Gen enrichment endpoint to again calculate these two variables. Since location location uh, requires points as an input, I'm going to be converting these uh, squares into the points, just taking the center the, the center of that uh, every extent of that square. Uh, very straightforward. And at the same time, I will be filtering out uh, where the uh, projected growth. Uh, in population, in kids' population, uh, is negative or zero. Uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm interested only in positive growth, essentially. And this is what I'm doing here. So uh, I created uh, a, an array of features here with uh, this new field called uh, pop0 underscore delta, which is essentially my derivative uh, of how the kids' population is going to grow in every that cell which uh, I showed you above. Now I'm converting this uh, into a data frame, data frame, and uh, also for the location-location uh, service, I'm actually converting this uh, field into the uh, field called weight. Weight is a, a term from the location-location service API, and this is uh, critical when I'm solving a capacitated location-location. This is important because uh, this facilities, candidate facilities, which I was given by a real estate agent, they are uh, of different size, of different capacity, so they can accommodate different number of kids. And besides uh, just uh, optimizing for the uh, travel time from kids' location to this childcare facilities, I also want to account for the available capacity every of these candidate facilities has. So uh, my demand point Every single demand point also has its weight. And this weight came from that joint enrichment endpoint. So this weight, this is what's, what is going to be allocated for the capacitated uh, candidate facilities during the location allocation solve. Okay, so we uh, ran this portion. And then the CSV file. The CSV file contains uh, the addresses which the real estate agent gave me. But as usually real estate agent, uh, agents do, they didn't give me the let long. They give me just the address. Well, it's not a big deal because actually, uh, I, again, with ArcGIS Online, I can easily geocode uh, these addresses into uh, uh, and place them on the map. And uh, as you can see, these addresses got converted into the actual points with the uh, shapes, uh, populated let longs. And the score. The score, this is something which is returned by the geocoding uh, endpoint. And this is what gives me the confidence. The confidence how well that address was recognized. And so far, everything looks good. Even 99.33 is actually perfectly acceptable. Uh, because spellings m might be slightly different. Uh, zip code might be slightly wrong or something like that. Um, now, let's see. Um, I'm going to create a data frame out of these geocoded uh, locations, the facilities, and then uh, again I'm going to uh, convert the address field returned by geocoding service into the name field. This is the name field which is used by the location location service to name the facilities. All right, so my facilities data frame is pretty much ready to go, uh, and I'm converting them into the feature sets right now because this is what is being communicated over the REST uh, call. And let's see how they actually look on the map. And uh, so here are these five addresses, five locations which were given to me by the real estate agent. Well, uh, now let's uh, actually get to the, to the core. So we uh, prepared all the data, and we are sending all these demand points which I created out of this uh, grid uh, Gen reached with the uh, Gen enrichment endpoint. Uh, and I'm uh, sending this, my facilities there as well. All of them have weights uh, in case of demand points and capacity in case of facilities. Uh, I'm solving so called maximized cover, uh, capacitated coverage problem, which essentially uh, allows me to minimize the travel time taking capacity into account. And since I'm solving it on the uh, Network graph. This is not a Euclidean straight 
uh, distance. I'm solving it actually on the transportation graph. So this is important that I specify the travel direction. Uh, so I'm accounting and optimizing the travel time which uh, will take parents to get from the houses to the childcare facility. This is, this is what I'm optimizing. So since, and since I'm solving it on the travel, uh, on the transportation graph, I would like to uh, keep, uh, I would like to keep the uh, one-way restrictions and the, rest and the turn restrictions accounted. This is why this is important. Uh, and the rest of the things are not that uh, critical, but uh, we already get the solution. We already got the solution here. And uh, let's visualize it on the map. Uh, I'm going to uh, run this big portion of code here and uh, actually do visualization uh, of the result. That uh, big portion of the code is not that uh, critical, and I will show you uh, the details in, the, in, in a second, but let's take a look at this map here, because this is the result. This is the result of your uh, business analysis. Uh, I got three blue chosen facilities. This is uh, the facilities with, which are most optimal to uh, pick, and I can, uh, by clicking on, on each, I can uh, see actually the uh, number of allocated weight, and uh, we see the demand weight is 43, so I com completely maxed out my capacity for, for this uh, child care facility, and uh, I will be able to take 43 kids in here, and, uh, but a more interesting, more interesting uh, piece was here, actually, with, uh, let me zoom in here. Uh, between these two. And uh, if you take a look. Yeah, one second. Maybe a little bit more zoom. Okay. Uh, 37 uh, capacity allocated. And this one, and you see this one had 35 capacity. So although they are pretty much in the same dense area of the kids, but because of, of the different capacity, I was able to take two, two kids more, uh, two kids more. So very straightforward uh, single page or single module notebook. Uh, having nothing but a CSV from a real estate agent, I was able to, uh, to uh, perform within a single day worth of work. Uh, a very complex business analysis, which is reproducible and which is explainable, and which you can uh, show to your investor or your wife, if she's an investor, uh, and be successful in the next five years, because this is the prognosis for the how child's population is going to grow over the next five years. Right, thank you very much. I think I'm done with this demo. Bilesh, do we have time for, the, for another one? Yes, let me just go through this. Okay. So what we learned from this uh, demo is the ArcGIS API for Python actually allows you to work with many different services, network analysis as well as other services. We saw we combined geo-enrichment and geocoding to actually solve the workflow. Now Jupyter Notebooks allow you a very nice way to illustrate what you're trying to do. So we had uh, textual descriptions, we had maps, we had code everything together. We didn't have charts, but you can also do charting if you want to. So it provides for a nice environment to share the analysis and those notebooks are simple text files. So you can share them, put them in your version control system and so on. So they work pretty well for doing exploratory data analysis. And Pandas data frame to work with various inputs and outputs. Like we were saying, we were uh, adding a new column, uh, transforming the columns, joining data, renaming columns. So in the Python API world, all that happens through Pandas data frame. Now I'm going to, if you have to go somewhere, you can, but Dimitri is going to show an interesting demo. So I would say you stick with it and see how Python API can be used with uh, machine learning. I would also like to mention that uh, initially I told you the slides and the notebooks will be available for this talk. So the child care facility notebook will be available, but this one is not because it requires uh, capabilities that are not yet released in the software. So this is a sneak peek on uh, what will be coming in the future. So, Dimitri.
just Oops, switch I to four. So now we are going to be looking at a slightly more technical notebook, uh, a little bit more concise, but uh, this one is going to uh, show you uh, uh, results uh, which are shown in a graphical way, um, results of a neural network, artificial neural network which predicts travel times, predicts, predicts travel times on a transportation graph. So it was trained with uh, GPS reports. Uh, how long does it take to, t to get from one location to another? And then essentially, uh, if you provide it with a, a set of uh, start and stop locations and, uh, uh, and the start time or departure time, then it will give you the time how, or the minutes, how, how long will it take to travel from point A to point B. Uh, so it takes also the traffic uh, or congestion conditions into account. So let me uh, show you how it looks and how it works. Uh, we also uh, exposed it through a WMS uh, REST API, which is an open geospatial consortium uh, standard. And uh, this is uh, here uh, a power of Python API as well, because since it's very well integrated with uh, Portal and with RGS uh, REST API, and the REST API is supported by the RGS platform, this automatically allows me to uh, work with uh, open source communities and uh, open data communities uh, in a seamless way. So here I'm looking at a web map. Uh, and this uh, blue blob here, this, uh, these are uh, so-called isochron. Uh, this is a so-called isochron which uh, shows you a travel time from the center, uh, from the center of my uh, map extent uh, to every single pixel on this uh, on this map, and the cutoff is 20 minutes. So uh, it's interesting that the neural network, because of its uh, all of one computational complexity at the back end on the inference, uh, is uh, so powerful and has such a tremendous throughput that I can calculate every single pixel of this um, map, which is about like one megapixel, so one one million ETAs are being calculated here on the fly to create this uh, blue blob. Uh, if we compare it to uh, the classical deterministic algorithms, uh, we will get uh, order of magnitude probably like three, uh, three order of magnitudes uh, slower throughput. So this is a very interesting project which we are uh, working on researching, but the question is how to um, how to do uh, validation, quality validation, how well our artificial neural network understands the transportation network underneath it. Uh, how can we verify it? Of course we have uh, uh, numeric methods uh, and we have charts of standard deviations uh, uh, bucketed into uh, different route length across different, um, uh, different regions, but uh, if you are familiar with uh, the service area algorithm of network analysis, which we just uh, see, have seen in the previous demo, then you uh, probably uh, have noticed that it's somewhat similar because both of them represent travel times from a particular location to the outer using transportation graph. So let's see actually if these things to, uh, if these two things really correlate to each other. And they should, if our neural network uh, has been trained well. So again, I'm going to be using uh, a little bit of a code here, and essentially ask to uh, overlay two things, one on top of another. So again, the blue blob is a, a neural network predicted travel time, and the red one is actually a service area polygon of corresponding, uh, corresponding size and the, and the departure time. And actually, as you can see, they match pretty well. The blue one, the blue blob predicted by the artificial neural network, uh, spans a little bit more into the open spaces where the actual roads do not exist. But that's perfectly fine because uh, uh, if we are going to be using that artificial neural network, we will be always placing the locations on the transportation network. And uh, by, by this making its, um, its, uh, its results, its predict predicting result, uh, results valid. And this is what uh, we are most interested in here. We are interested in how close these uh, spikes or the edge of the uh, red polygon, which spans along the highways, matches the border of the blue polygon. And as you can see, 
it matches pretty close. All right, and uh, again, this was achieved using just Python API to visualize it, and this is a quite uh, powerful uh, quality tool for that uh, neural network experiment, which if you are interested uh, in learning more about, uh, you can come tomorrow uh, to a session which will be uh, held at one o'clock, uh, right next door, actually, in this room uh, behind me. So thank you very much, I think I'm done with this demo as well. Back to yeah, we are also done here, so in summary, we learned today that we need to choose the correct analysis time. I'm stressing this because time and again we find people making mistakes here. They pick the wrong analysis type and from that point onwards everything goes wrong. So please pick the right analysis type and then because we have so many different services that can do the same analysis, make sure you understand the services, what are their capabilities, what are their limitations and then pick the right service type. Once you have picked the analysis and the service type, use the Python API and go ahead and do your analysis. So again, this is the URL where you can find the slides and the first Jupyter notebook. We showed you how you can execute through that without actually installing any software on it. So uh, that's all, we'll open up for questions and have a great conference for the remainder of the time. Thanks for attending the workshop. <laughs>